Now, wow, that's, a, that's an impressive graphic. Have you ever had trouble with a really angry person? These persons just go from 0 to 60 in like 2.8 seconds. Here's some solutions. First solution, this kind of seems like an odd one, is that angry people usually just need somebody to listen to them. Why are they angry? They feel like something has been done against them, people aren't hearing what they're saying, they want to express their anger, and they want somebody to listen that, hey, I'm not okay with this. So rather than coming back and telling them why they shouldn't be angry or how they need to calm down or this or that, listen for a little while. Gently agree with them. I can see where you'd be upset with that. I'd be angry too if that happened to me. I can see you're really upset. Tell me a little bit more about that. As they tell you, they're going to vent and hopefully they're going to release and then they're going to let it go. And they'll no longer be a problem for you or for anybody else. Almost nobody will ever listen to them. When somebody gets angry, they immediately try to calm them down. They immediately try running away. They immediately, you know, attack back. They try all these different things. They try everything but listening. So in understanding why the person is angry, listening is a good solution. Here's what else I'm going to tell you about it. Angry people are hurt. They're damaged individuals and they need some empathy. They need some sympathy. Nobody is that angry without having been horribly damaged. Now, sometimes you're not a therapist and you can't always fix it, but sometimes just understanding that they're a hurt person or a sick person as opposed to a bad or nasty or evil person really helps them. And if you can show a little bit of empathy for their problems and a little empathy towards them, know that they must have lived a hard road to, to be this angry, that can often help the person. Now, here's a great solution which can be very effective. Simply ask them, what would it take to solve the problem? A lot of times this person is so angry because they're frustrated. They have a problem, they just can't deal with it, it seems like nobody's listening to them, or they've tried everything and they're just on their last nerve. Plus, getting them out of the problem and focusing on the solution is a brilliant thing to do. In AA they say when I stopped focusing on the problem and I started focusing on the solution, the problem disappeared. They're angry because they're thinking about the problem, thinking about the problem, thinking about the problem. That's what's growing in their mind. If you ask them what would it take to solve the problem and you genuinely assist them, the problem will go away or at least they'll feel better that at least one person wanted to help them solve the problem. They'll feel better about you and the anger will dissipate. Now finally, you notice this one repeats, you may need to kick their butt and back them off. Set a good limit. If you've tried all these different strategies and you say, hey, Mr. Paul, I tried all these. Uh, Professor Paul told me to try this technique and this technique. I tried it all. And they just keep ranting. At some point, you have to what? Shut it down. Tell them enough's enough. I tried to help you. I was very good about it. But you can't talk to me this way. I'm going to be very assertive. You've hit one of my what? Boundaries, not guidelines, boundaries, and enough's enough. Kick their butt. You'll notice this one repeats. Walk away and avoid them in the future. Perfectly good strategy. I would use this one over and over and over again with an angry person. Again, proximity rule. They can't be yelling at you if you're not in the area. Here's another strange technique. You can give them a gift, and a gift is any kind of favor that you do for them, any, any little thing that you give them, you know? You say, hey, you sound like you're very upset. Let's go and let's talk about this at the bar across the street. Let me buy you a drink. And all of a sudden, they can be angry, but they won't be angry across the street. They can't be angry when you're doing something nice for them, like buying them a drink and listening to their problems. How can they ever stay angry at you? Very, very difficult. They will tend to either go along with your suggestion and then that solves it or they'll say screw you I'm not going for a drink but they'll walk away it's the end of the conversation because they were mean and you were nice it throws them totally off and they have to leave now it blows their system now here's another type of problem person a chatterbox blah 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 they talk all day long we got some great solutions here for you. 
Remember I said, walk away, I want you to run away. <laughs> These people are never going to stop talking. There is no great solution to this. I got a second one for you. Hide and don't let them find you. <laughs> These people are problematic because you're not a therapist and you can't teach them to stop chatting. So there's not a lot of great ways to stop this. You just have to make sure that it's not a problem for you. Here's another solution. Chatterboxes are chattering. Why? Because they figure if they're talking, then they're doing something productive. They're at work and they're moving and they're talking and they're doing something. They figure if somebody walks by, you can say, well, we were just talking about business and it feels like they're still working when they're actually they're doing the exact opposite of working. How much would you pay per hour for somebody to sit there and bitch, whine, and complain or just talk about nothing? Not much. You won't see any want ads for that because nobody wants to pay dollar one for that. It's worthless. So these chatterboxes, half the time, they're just naturally chatterboxes. The other half the time, they're doing it to avoid work. So if you get right to work, they'll stop chatting because they know you have to concentrate on what you're doing. Now, if that doesn't work, ask them to help you with something. Put them to work. They are massively afraid of work. This technique works wonders. You can also do the old fake phone call trick. Oh, hi, Bernadette. I didn't realize it was you. Yeah, I was just talking to Bob. Excuse me, Bob. I have to take this. And you're off the hook. Here's another solution. It's just for fun. Apply duct tape. <laughs> now you have to check your local laws in your area. I don't think this is legal in the state of Florida, but I just think this is funny. I had a friend. He thought he could fix anything with duct tape. A uh, carpet coming up in the corner, use duct tape. Hole in your tailpipe, use duct tape. Dog won't stay put, use duct tape. Thousand and one uses, right? Here's another type of uh, problem person, a know-it-all or a sexual intellectual, right? I love this one. It says, I know everything, just ask me and I'll tell you. So how do you deal with a know-it-all? solution. Ask them for a ton of information that is way too much work. Now, if you ask them for a bunch of information, where'd you find that? Can you get me a citation for that? Can you find me more information on that? Do you have any literature on that? They just want to throw out random information. They don't want to do any work. And half the time, their stuff is erroneous. It's not true, or it's made up, or they can't prove it. So do a very simple secondary technique. Ask them to prove it. Where did you see that? Where did you find that? What's your evidence? Where could I find information on that? You can even act like you believe him. See, that sounds great, but I got a friend, his name's John, and he'll never believe me if I tell him that. Do you happen to have a reference for that? Or how can I prove that to John? He gave some decent arguments, but he, he's really a scientist about these things. He needs exact proof. What can I share with him? Most of these people will run like hell at that point. Now, the other way to kind of shut them down a little bit is to agree with their point, but help them see a new perspective. What does this do? It shows them that they don't know it all. So if you can find a new twist on it, a way they never thought about it, they'll kind of let things go. Or I can ask them a question that I know they can't answer. So if they say, hey, you know, uh, aspirin is really good for arthritis, I say, did you know there's a study out there that shows it is good for arthritis? It helps to reduce inflammation in the joints. That relieves pain. Did you also know that it weakens the cartilage if you keep using that over and over again? And weakened cartilage does what? It creates arthritis. So it makes you feel better now and feel worse later. And they're like, oh, I didn't realize that. They're interested. They like that you taught them something, you did it in a very gentle way, but now they're not going to go on for 15 minutes because they thought they were the A number one expert on this. Now they realize they're not. They've got to reassess everything. They're feeling like they're in a position of weakness now where before they thought they had absolute expert authority and strength, and they slow their roll. Here's another technique. You, you, you want to let them know that you're that they're bothering you and that you may swat them. <laughs> I love this graphic because it's absolutely perfect. You know, 
Uh, let them know that they're just annoying. Nobody wants to hear about this stuff. Nobody wants to hear about your arthritis and all this different stuff and your aches and your pains and blah, 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 blah. Let it go. Not that entertaining. Not as much fun as you would think, Bob. Here's another technique. Use the proximity rule. You know, I have certain relatives and certain uh, old friends that, you know, they're very good in small increments. You know, they're good in five-minute bursts. They talk too much. They know it all. They go on and on and on. What I try to do is keep phone calls short, keep meetings short, keep conversations short. Almost like as if you're dating. You don't go out to dinner because that's a two-hour adventure. You go out for a cup of coffee because that's a five to ten minute adventure and you could always walk away. So use the proximity rule. Just get away from them. Here's another classic problem. Trouble with a nagging spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, coworker. Nag, nag, nag. Absolutely, positively, no fun, very challenging. So, how do you deal with it? Solution number one. Realize that this person is probably having some kind of emotional problem. So take out your therapist hat and try to help them a little bit. Notice what kind of challenges they're having. Try to reframe it for them. Give them a better perspective on things. Point them in the direction of where they can get help for these different types of challenges. Here's another solution. Talk to them about the things that they're complaining about. Let them talk it out, which means let them go on for a little bit. Let them vent so they can decompress. When they get down to a decompression level where you can actually have a human conversation with them, slow their roll and get them to focus on the solution, not on the problem. Remember when you focus on the solution, the problem disappears? Use that philosophy with them, and people will stop nagging when you start focusing on the solution. They can nag endlessly about a problem, but they can't continue to nag while focused on a solution because nagging is problem-focused, not solution-focused. works amazingly well. Another strategy, just hand them their head. Sometimes you need to set good boundaries and say, hey, you keep nagging and nagging and nagging. This needs to stop, okay? Go do this with your husband or wife. Go do this with your friends. Go do this with your dog. Don't do it with me. See you later. Now, and this is kind of strange, when you have these problem people in your life, okay, maybe it's a significant other, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a good friend, business partner, sometimes you need to try counseling. I can remember when I was doing a lecture like this and I did it up on a board, I had a big whiteboard, and I say, what's all the different solutions to this problem? And in a room full of 35 counselors, not one person came up with the possible solution of, hello, you could try counseling. <laughs> Apparently, they're not very good counselors because they didn't even think of counseling as an option for how to solve problems. Matter of fact, the core of counseling is not getting into your business, not getting all emotional. You have a problem, you share it with a counselor, and they counsel you on a solution, right? Perfect. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Ideas presentation of Dealing with Difficult People. Won't you please give a warm welcome to Professor Paul Klein? Hey, there I am with my buddy JJ on the left. I'm on the right with the face built for radio. As you can see from the background, I like to read a book or two. We want to give you the latest cutting edge skills. We want to literally transform your life by giving you the best skills available. Now, here's a few of the goals for the training. These are not all the goals, but in broad strokes, here's what we're going to bring you today. One, gain an awareness and an understanding of ourselves and why we get so angry at others. Two, how to gain control of others by gaining control of ourselves. Three, general tips for dealing with problem people and anger. Four, how to deal with specific types of problem people. And in the end, I want you just to have a lot of fun with this. Now, the first concept you need to understand is that you don't get mad for the reasons you think. So why do you get mad? I'm glad you asked. 
you get mad for three main reasons. First reason is number one, resistance to reality. Number two, negative self-talk. And three, you care. We're going to go over these in this training in detail right now. Now remember this quote, your frustration will be an exact one-to-one -one proportion to your resistance to reality. What is it that's real in your life, that's happening in your life, that you're just not accepting? In the big book of AA, there's a quote that says, and acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. Acceptance is key. When you resist reality, it only gets worse and creates frustration. So, how do we stop resisting reality? Well, we start by gaining self-control and letting go of misconceptions. Here's a great quote to remember by Jim Rohn. Don't wish that the other person would get better. Wish that you had more skill. Jim Rohn, one of the great corporate trainers out there. When I was a therapist, I couldn't wish that my clients were going to get better. They were supposed to be sick. That was their job. My job was to help them get better. How could I do that? I could only do it by adding more skills. As I became more skillful, they had less problems, and I even had less problems with them. So, write this down, put this in your notes. Don't wish the other person would get better. Wish you had more skill. And I'm proud of you because that's what you're actually doing today. You are going to know more about how to deal with difficult people and how to deal with your own issues than 99.9% .9 of the people out there in the world. Now, here's something else you need to remember. All control starts with self-control. Everyone seems to think that eliminating frustration is all about controlling the other person. It really starts with controlling yourself. You're the center. If I have self-control, I can control myself, nobody can upset me. If I can't control myself, then anybody can upset me. So to have mastery, I have to decide if I'm going to get upset. Everybody is going to invite you to get upset, but you don't have to take every invitation you get. So, how do I control myself? You start by letting go of some of your crazy ideas. Here's a good list of them. One, people should have the same values and beliefs that I do. Well, maybe they should, but guess what? They don't. Two, people should do what I want them to do. My God, that would be lovely, and they're not going to do it. Three, people shouldn't act in ways that upset me. That's probably true. And guess what? They're going to. Four, people should care about the things that I care about. You're right. They probably should, and they don't. Five, people shouldn't get in my way. They shouldn't, and guess what? They're going to. Six, People should always treat me with kindness and respect. Absolutely they should. And they're not going to. Still more crazy ideas. People make me angry, upset, sad, etc. No. You make yourself angry, upset, and sad over the things that people say. Two. People should understand me. Yes, they should. And guess what? They don't. Three. I feel guilty when, insert your neurosis here, don't let other people make you feel guilty. Four, people should be there for me when I need them. And guess what? They're not always going to be there. Five, inanimate objects are out to get me. You know how when you're driving down the road and your tire blows and you're late for a meeting and you kick the tire and you say, stupid tire? It's almost as if it knew that I had a meeting. No, absolutely not. Another crazy idea. Life should be fair. Life isn't fair. The only fair I've ever seen is the one in Tampa. It's great. You should come. They have a tractor pull, Ferris wheels, all kinds of great food and rides. That's about the only fair you're ever going to see. See, when you're a child from the age of 0 to 18, people run around and try to make things fair. So people have this crazy idea that life should be fair. No, that's an illusion we created in your childhood. And from 18 on, it's no longer true. Actually, it was never true correct? So, how do we get rid of these ideas? Well, one, dispute them. That's what I've been doing. I read you off the ideas. 
and then I gave you the dispute. Two, replace them. What does that mean? Replace it with a better idea. And three, let it go. Here's a great thought for you. If you don't control your mind, who does? You need to learn how to control your mind. It's a key life skill. I don't know why they don't teach this in middle school and high school. I love this quote by Plato. You might want to write this one down. The first and best victory is to conquer self. To be conquered by self is, of all things, the most shameful and vile. Plato. Remember, no one controls you unless you allow it. So, how do I practice self-control? By practicing. Duh. <laughs> Don't worry. Life will give you lots of chances to practice. I want you to start seeing difficult people as your gift. When they become difficult, they are giving you a chance to practice these new skills. You can't get really good at these skills until you practice them. So these skills will work kind of like 50%, 60%, 70%, maybe 80% the first time you try them, but each time you use them, they'll get stronger and stronger because you're gaining new understandings of how to use them, and you may even be creatively combining these different cutting-edge tools into a new and more powerful formula and really making it your own. And you're also learning mentally that because I know I can deal with these challenges and I don't have to live with them, I don't have to get too worried about them. So you're going to have lots and lots of chances to practice. You're doing absolutely fantastic, and I'll see you in the next section. Okay, welcome back. We're in the final section. Can you believe it? Where did all the time go? You've done an amazing job. I can tell you statistically, slightly less than 5% of people who go out they're lucky enough to find a course like this, they purchase it, only 5% or less will go all the way through the end and actually complete it. They have a challenge in their life, they've taken the time, they've found the resource, they have it in their hand, and still less than 5% will ever actually use it. Then they sit around and they whine and they complain. How come I have these problems in my life? How come these things keep happening to me? And to them, it's an entire mystery. They never figure it out. What's the challenge? They are. But that's not you. You're the one out of 20 that's going to be massively successful. You're going to have skills in this area, and you're going to be able to share this with family, friends, coworkers. Pass this on to other people. Once you learn a great skill, you always want to share it. So this course is my gift to you. Your gift to me can be sharing it with other people and we make the world a better place. I think that's a beautiful thing to do. But I just want to tell you, I'm amazingly proud of you. If nobody's told you that they're proud of you today, let me be the first. Let's jump right in. We've got some additional final tips which are key to your success. Now, I'm glad you got to this section because what actually causes the pain from the difficult people is not the difficult people themselves. The thing that causes 99% of the pain is you. So the bad news is it's you. <laughs> we would have liked to have thought it was the other person. But the good news is it's you. So you control it. The challenge is not that somebody took 5 to 20 seconds out of their day to say something nasty to you. because That's about how long it takes. That's not the challenge, trying to get that 5 to 20 seconds back. It's the fact that you repeat it in your head a thousand to ten thousand times. So they're responsible for one unit of pain and you're responsible for somewhere between a thousand to ten thousand. See where the bulk of the pain's coming from? It's the fact that you keep replaying these old movies in your head, these mental movies of what happened. If it had simply happened and you had let it go, it would have been insignificant in your life. And 99% of it would have been forgotten within a day or two. Now some of these things can last your entire life, right? Why? Because you practiced and rehearsed them in your head so many times. There's an old AA expression, Alcoholics Anonymous, and it simply states, if somebody had done to me what I did to myself, I'd have killed them. You are really doing the harm to you. Stop replaying these movies in your head. Matter of fact, if I go to a bad movie, 
I get like halfway through and I'm like, this is rubbish. I walk out. I sure as hell don't go back 1,000 to 10,000 times and watch it over and over again. And then complain to people that, the, that somebody made a horrible movie. You're the one making the movie. Just let it go. My dad gave me a good analogy of this. He said, okay, it's going to take somebody five seconds to ten seconds to say something nasty to you. There's 330 million people in America. About 10% of them are jerks. That's 30 million. If each one of them gets, say, 20 seconds of your life, your life is going to be over about 500 times. So don't give them more than that 10 to 20 seconds. Certainly don't extend it out to hours and weeks and years. That's crazy. Don't replay the old movies in your head. Now, here's the ultimate solution for you. Read this book over and over again. I love this book. This was a great little book. It's kind of a cute book. It's kind of a fun book, but it teaches you specific tools, strategies, and techniques for how to deal with screwed up people and why they're so screwed up. So I think that's a great book to have on your shelf. Uh, you can buy it for just a few dollars on Amazon. Go ahead and get it used. I'm going to make a few book recommendations to you. I don't think any of these books cost more than $10 on Amazon, even with shipping. But go ahead and check it out. Now, other reading recommendations. Coping with Difficult People. That's another one on dealing with anger management and dealing with difficult people, just like the training you've been through. Here's another one specific to dealing with your anger. If these people are really making you angry, if that's an issue for you, you know, you might be one of those people that lets it go. Fine, then you wouldn't need this book. But if it continues to burn you over time, after the issue has happened, after they've said those uh, five seconds to 20 seconds, you're still angry, grab this book. It's called Angry All the Time, An Emergency Guide to Anger Control. Very simple book. If you want something a little bit more sophisticated, I would get this one. It's called Your Erroneous Zones. It's an old classic by Wayne Dyer. I think he did it back in the 70s, but a wonderful book. I used it in therapy many times. Uh, I treasure it as a guide on my shelf. And it'll not only help you with the anger management, but it's going to help you with a lot of different areas. It, they call it the erroneous zones because these are all the false and negative beliefs that you have that make your life less livable. And if you're simply aware of them, you can do a quick turnaround and multiple areas of your life will get better. So that's a very powerful book. I would definitely get that one. There's another one. This one's actually on the Zen philosophy. This will help you peace out about pretty much everything and have a new perspective on life. Give you a lot of beautiful new philosophies to make your life even better. It's called The Power of Now. It was like a number one bestseller. I don't know for how long. It's by Eckhart Tolle. And that's a wonderful book to get. And this one I really like is by Richard Carlson. He's the one who wrote Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. It's called You Can Be Happy No Matter What. Don't you have to own a book by that title and have that book up on your shelf? Absolutely, positively. I would get every single one of these books. I think we're talking about six books, so maybe 60 to $70 tops. Boom, you're done. Pick through. Spend 5, 10, 15 minutes a day, maybe 4 or 5 days a week. By the end of the year, you're going to have solved so many of your problems, you will be amazed. You will leapfrog 10, 20, 30 years ahead of where you should be mentally and be so squared away, it will be amazing. That's, that's my wish for you. That's my gift to you. Now, final recommendation. If you don't want people to push your buttons, remove them. Why are people upsetting you? Clients would come to me and say, Paul, this person keeps pushing my buttons. They keep pushing my buttons. And you know what I would say to them? I would say, oh, then just remove the button. What do I mean by that? Well, what happens is when somebody says something, almost like in the movie Back to the Future, every time somebody called Marty McFly chicken, he got wildly upset. It took him three movies to figure this out. Just stop caring when people call you chicken. That's literally removing the button. Then, when somebody called Marty McFly chicken, he's like, yeah, so? He didn't care. The button was removed. So people could push this dead button. It's like you snip the wires on it. They're pushing this dead button, and nothing is happening. 
That's what you need to do with each of your buttons. Anytime somebody pushes your button, they make you upset, they're showing you an area that you need to get over and therefore you've killed the button. Then people can come up between now and you die and push that button and you'll only laugh because you'll be looking at them like a fool while they're pushing a dead button. Just imagine somebody there like pushing a doorbell button and you disconnected the ringer 10 years ago and you're just laughing because they think you know you're gonna come to the door and they're gonna sell you something you know these people wanna sell you on getting angry so they push the button I also want you to think of buttons as like slavery they push the button and then you have to get angry so all they gotta do is push the button and it takes them like we said just five to twenty seconds to push the button and then you've gotta spend days weeks months and years of your life feeling bad nobody should have that much control over you that much power that they put in such little effort and it causes you such massive pain remove the buttons here's me and my buddy JJ again I want to thank you so much for joining us today please give this training a great rating and I've got my website here. We've got a lot of uh, low cost, no cost, mostly free stuff here on my website. So help yourself to that. All free content. So I'm excited about that. I love to do the extra. I love to give the extra. If you have any questions, any concerns, any issues, please write me wherever you purchase this course. I try to respond as quickly as I can. I love to hear from my students. Like I said, I'm so amazingly proud of you. Please come back. Please get some more of my courses. Please let your friends know about my courses. I hope you had a wonderful experience here. It's been a wonderful experience for me and JJ. We love you. We care about you. We want to see you do great in life. That's my mission is to spread as much knowledge as I can nationally and internationally to help as many people as I can. Thanks so much for being part of our team and I'll see you in my next training. Hey everybody, Professor Paul here. We got an amazing training here for you today. We're gonna to teach you how to deal with difficult emotions and literally make them pass you by. If you get this one thing in your life, your life will be changed forever, I promise you. So let's jump right in. Okay, now, everybody needs to learn how to deal with difficult emotions. There's emotions of anger, there's emotions of fear, frustration, depression. You can use this towards whatever you wanna apply it for. To keep it simple, to keep it easy, I'm gonna use this towards anger. And we're gonna start by looking at what are the typical strategies that people use and why they work or why they fail. So the first technique that people use to get over something is they use what's called the time technique. So what they do is the anger or the frustration gets inside of them and it goes round and round and round, burning them up, tearing them up, physically, psychologically, mentally, draining all their energy, and it goes round and round and round, and eventually it slows down. This could take days, months, or years, and it peters out. This is the absolute te worst technique, but it is by far the most popular. This is why most people lose, and they don't know how to deal with anger or frustration. They accept to yell at people and drink and do all these crazy things and just let time go by. Worst, worst technique. Second technique, it's called venting a little bit better people have a difficult issue they let it in and then it goes round and round and round round and round and around and eventually they i don't know kick the dog hit the heavy bag <laughs> talk to somebody uh, do something to try to uh, release some of this emotion and that's called the venting technique this does less damage slows things down, we're getting a little better. At least we're doing something besides nothing and waiting for something to happen. So we're getting a lot better. Here's a great technique. They teach this in counseling and AA and NA and recovery groups. And it's simply called letting go, letting go. So the anger comes in, they get upset, starts to burn them up and they say, hey, you know what? I don't really need this challenge in my life. I'm gonna let it go eventually. Why don't I let it go early? Why don't I let it go now? I don't want this to continue to hurt me. It's not doing me any good. I'm simply gonna let it go. And they release it. Wonderful. 
Much better technique. Absolute worst is time. A little bit better is venting, letting go. But this is not the supreme technique. I've got a technique that is the supreme technique. Let me share it with you. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna teach you Kung Fu. Wouldn't that be awesome? Excellent. We're gonna sash up our gi. We're gonna get our, our high collars on. We're gonna do a little chop sake. I'll teach you the ancient art of Kung Fu. Here's what you do. You are gonna have the same challenge coming at you that everybody else has, but you're gonna deal with it differently. Let me tell you a little story. Uh, my Kung Fu instructor was working with me and we were working on all these blocks and techniques and ways of not getting hit, which was really good for me. <laughs> uh, I asked my instructor out of all these different blocks and techniques, and I really wanted to focus on one and get like super good at it. I said, what is the absolute best technique, the best block, the best way not to get hit? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, Oh, I know. That one's simple, Paul. Here's what I want you to do. Whenever they throw a punch or a kick, here's what I want you to do. Don't be there. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I want that too. So that's what he taught me. He taught me how to sidestep these types of things and how to make these things go around me. So wherever the punch or kick was, I wasn't there. I was someplace else. They punch at my face here. I'm over here. They punch at me here. I'm over here. Don't be there. Or another technique that they do in Kung Fu, uh, you probably saw this in the Karate Kid too, is where he had the drum and he just let everything go around him. He let everything go around him. He would let everything go around him. That's what we would do. Punch or kick would come in. We would simply what? Step out of the way, not be there, and let it go around us. That's what I want you to do. That's the Kung Fu technique. Watch. You see a problem. You know there's a problem. You're not going to let it in. You are simply going to recognize it and let it go by. People say, well, you're not being very emotional. You're, uh, you're being robotic. No, you're not. You're acting with wisdom instead of deciding to get upset because you have a problem, because it is a decision. You're deciding not to. And let me show you what that means. And this is a great bonus, bonus technique that'll really solidify this whole thing for you. I'm gonna show you three things and you tell me what's the unnecessary step. So audience participation part. You have a problem. That's item number one. Next, based on that problem, you get upset. <laughs> number three, you solve the problem. One, two, three. Audience participation, can you pick out the unnecessary step? Is there a problem? Does the problem have to exist? Yeah, or we wouldn't even be here. Do you have to solve the problem? Yes, we have to solve the problem. Do you have to get upset? No. Damn, you guys are good. You found the unnecessary step. <laughs> Give yourself a hand. Awesome. So, you're doing fantastic. Now, we don't think about it this way. Somebody says, well, when you have a problem, you have to get upset. And if you told people that you had a problem, they say, oh, that's so bad, and they would invite you to get upset. That's so horrible for you, Paul. Do you need a hug? No, do you? <laughs> I don't need one, why? Because it never touched me. People think this is amazing when you do it, because somewhere in your life, somebody told you that if you have a problem, you absolutely, positively must get upset. I don't know who said this to you, where this idiot lives, but I need you to get a private investigator, go find this person and give them a quick, swift kick in the butt because they lied to you. And then everybody else jumped in and said, oh yeah, that's so true, that's so true. Oh, I feel so bad for you, Paul. You have this problem. A little tear would come out of their eye. These people are idiots. <laughs> You don't have to have this. This is a strange thing that in American culture, we are taught that problem equals upset, okay? In other cultures, some cultures like uh, Asian cultures, they say when you have a problem, you can create a solution and this equals money and opportunity. And you can feel fantastic about having solved the problem and not feel bad, but feel good. Hey, one less problem. 
I'll give you one bonus, bonus, bonus technique, okay? It's called Paul's Amazing Crap Pile. Here's Paul's Amazing Crap Pile. Couple little flies. People can't believe I've only had one art lesson, okay? In life, crap is gonna happen to you. There's only X amount of crap that happens to you. Maybe you have 100 units of crap that's going to happen to you. So when you have a problem, instead of saying, oh, poor me, why did this happen? I wish I could have avoided that. Uh, no. X number of problems are going to happen no matter how good you are at avoiding problems. So if from point A to point B, from start to finish, Uncle Paul here is going to have 100 problems, here's how I look at it philosophically to decide whether or not I need to get upset. I look at it and I say, okay, right now I'm having a problem, but I'm going to get rid of it, and that's going to be 99 problems instead of 100. I'm feeling absolutely fantastic. Here's why. My pile is getting smaller. This pile of crap that I don't want is getting smaller, and I'm excited, not upset. <laughs> this is a great way to live. Don't live thinking, oh my God, this was a horrible thing. Why do they do this to me? I'm a good guy. I walk little old ladies across the street. This was especially visited upon me. Darn it, life just isn't fair. No, it's perfectly fair. And you're getting your pile smaller and smaller. You have wonderful techniques now that virtually nobody else has to deal with these things. You know how to use this formulation to feel better. And anytime you get upset, I want you to write this formula down on paper just so you see it until it becomes visceral for you. You can feel it emotionally and intellectually. Put those two powers together and keep drilling down how true these things that I'm saying right now are. It'll become an emotional part of you and you will nail these things. At first, it'll seem like it's a technique. It's a little slow. It kind of sort of works and then it works better. As you practice this, it will get better and better, stronger and stronger every single day, and you'll get stronger too. Thanks for joining us for this video. You've been a fantastic audience. My name is Professor Paul. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome back. You're doing an absolutely amazing job. Now, here's some of the ways that we allow people to control us. And the first one, this is a big one, is guilt. We've been taught to feel bad about ourselves from childhood if we don't do things for others. This is how people controlled us. But it's also how we got our societal conscience so we don't end up as psychopaths. <laughs> so it's an important skill, but the secondary skill that you need is how to move past guilt. Resentment. When others hurt us, we carry the hurt for free. My question to you is why? Why let them rent space in your head? Again, the answer is let it go. Love. When does love become manipulation? My wife is really good at this. She says, oh honey, my shoulder hurts. Can you give me a back rub? And I say, okay, but let me finish my project. And she says, but honey, if you loved me, that's the exact moment love becomes manipulation. Ego. We are our greatest strength and our greatest weakness. Sometimes our ego gets a hold of us. We think people shouldn't be able to do this and shouldn't be able to do that to us. And the reality is, we talked about this in the last section, they can and they will. Now, a great way of letting go is an old Zen expression. It says people are always perfectly being themselves. They're probably not going to change. I'm a therapist. You got to pay me $300 an hour to sit down and have you change. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And that only with the most motivated clients. And that might take me 16 to 20 sessions to create a dramatic change in who you are. So simply allow people to be themselves. Let it go. Here's another great technique. See angry people as hurt, not bad. I remember when I first started doing drug and alcohol counseling, they said, here's what I want you to do. Picture the patient with a huge bandage on their head. 
Why? That way you'll see them as hurt and sick. They're not bad people getting good, they're sick people getting well. And when they curse you out and write your name on the bathroom wall and they do all these nasty things to you, when they resist your treatment, when they cause you all kinds of problems, realize that's why they're here. They're sick. You work in a hospital. What kind of people live in a hospital? Sick people. That's right, exclusively. As a matter of fact, when they stop doing these behaviors, they're too damn healthy and you have to discharge them. So always see other people that are difficult as sick, not bad. As hurt, not bad. It'll help you have a lot more compassion with them and be a lot more gentle on yourself. Now also know that people are sometimes going through a difficult time. You don't know what's happening in the other person's life. They could have a divorce or some kind of really deeply emotional breakup. They could be going through a layoff or unemployment. They could have had somebody very close to them die. Maybe their mother died. Maybe their wife died. Maybe it happened under horrible circumstances. I had one addict. He backed over his child in the driveway. That was not a good day. That was a major trauma for him, his family, everybody around him. Mental illness can be another issue. What percentage of people in the population do you think are mentally ill? It's actually 25% at any given time. And as a matter of fact, I think it's 51.6% of people lifetime will have a major mental health disorder. That means if you're healthy, mentally healthy, you don't have a mental health disorder between now and you die, you're actually abnormal. <laughs> you're in the minority. Now, it could be a sick child or parent that they're dealing with at home. Alzheimer rates are huge. Kids get sick all the time. Could be a new baby. Maybe they're not even sick. Babies are amazing. They sleep 16 hours a day, but they like to do it in about 20 minute to 40 minute increments. And the rest of the time they're up, they're crying, they're moving around, and they need attention. They could have an injury that you don't know about. They could have a horrible back pain, shoulder pain. They could be having migraines. There's all kinds of things that could be going on. They could have cancer. You don't know. There could be a million other things that are going on. So please try to have a little bit of compassion for why they act the way they act. There's always a reason. People don't do anything for quote-unquote no reason. And I love this quote by Longfellow. If you're taking notes, please write this one down and go ahead and capture a screenshot. If we could read the secret history of our enemies, we would find in their lives sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. I remember there's another quote like this. It says, be kind to everybody you meet. They've just returned from a hard battle. What's that battle? It's called life. It's rough out there. People don't have it easy. And a lot of people, I don't know what your background is, but for most people, other people have had it even worse. So, quick reality check. People are not going to change because you want them to or because they should change. That is never, ever going to happen. Snap out of it. Now, our control over our emotions, one of the great ways to control your emotions, is to change your explanatory style and our responses. Now I'm going to teach you what an explanatory style is. Explanatory style means literally the way in which we explain things to ourselves. You're having a rough day. Notice how I described it to myself, how I explained it to myself. It was a rough day. If I say, how was your day? And you say, well, just another day in the battlefield. You mean every day you go to work and it's like going to war? <laughs> That's a horrible way to describe it. Why don't you say I had a rough day or I had a tough day or things weren't great, but they could be better. Change the way you explain things to yourself. I told you all the different problems people could be having in their lives because that's a better way to explain who they are so you can treat them with more compassion. It's not they're a god-awful person. They have cancer. See how quickly that changes how you view the person? It's not they're grouchy all the time, it's that they've got a new baby. It's not that they're a mean or cruel person, you just don't understand. They're a year and a half into this nasty divorce, and they're not happy with anybody, including themselves. 
So change the way that you explain things to yourself. Now, this is very important. I want you to know that it is impossible to be disrespected. Why? Because respect is internal, not external. You either respect yourself or you don't. If you only respect yourself on the days that other people respect you, you're going to have some really bad days. As a matter of fact, see the picture of the guy yelling at the other guy here? Can you spot the jerk in the picture? Yeah, everybody else can. So when somebody disrespects you in public, everybody knows who is being the jerk, and everybody also knows who is being calm and who is being cool about it. They respect the guy who is being cool about it. They disrespect the jerk. Isn't that true? Also remember, your respect is internal, not external. You can call me anything you want. You can say I'm a bluebird. It doesn't turn me into a bluebird. Nothing you say will ever impact who and what I actually am. It's words. When somebody's disrespecting me, you know what I hear? Blah, 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 blah. That's it. Because their words have no meaning, no impact in reality. It's simply an invitation for me to get upset, and I don't accept every invitation I get. Now, can you spot the jerk in this picture? No, because they're both going back and forth. Look at the previous picture. When somebody's being a jerk to you, but you're being cool, everybody can spot the jerk. They know what's going on. The minute you engage and you start giving as good as you get, then nobody can figure out who's the jerk. As a matter of fact, if you were to look at this and I said, who's the jerk? You'd probably say what? Both of them. So, I think it's key to have compassion because we also have bad days. You know, somebody else out there is probably taking this course and thinking about you. <laughs> you know, my wife's probably out there right now taking this course saying, how do I deal with my difficult husband? Okay? Because we're not always that lovable. We have bad days. You know, things happen to us. So, to be compassionate to other person means we get compassion back. So I always like to give what I want to receive. Now, one of the strange reasons why you have uh, so much anger and you have so much frustration is because you care. Now we think of caring as a very kind, loving thing, and it is, but sometimes the ability not to care is amazingly freeing. And I put this bumper sticker up here. It says, I feel so much better since I gave up hope. I actually had a girlfriend named Hope and she caused me a lot of problems and eventually we broke up and I got this bumper sticker and I slapped it on my car but it's also true of life when you give up hope when you stop caring these are things that are binding you making you cling to situations and making them painful for you how do you solve it you simply let go stop caring give up hope Now, interesting psychological fact. Most of our quote-unquote reasons for getting mad are actually excuses. We lack self-control, and we blame the other person for our weaknesses. Why is it that when somebody says this, you have to instantly get mad? The challenge isn't that people say nasty things to you. The challenge is, is that you don't know how to deal with it when people say nasty things to you. Isn't that another way to look at it? I'm a martial artist. I was taught mental control from day one. So I know when people say things, that's just their point of view. That's just them acting out their drama. I don't have to get involved. I never let anybody decide how I'm going to feel. Why? Because I have control of myself. That's what the martial arts is. First thing you do is you learn how to control yourself, and then you can control anybody else. So, taking responsibility. I love this little caption here. I hope you do too. Uh, learn to ask yourself, how are you attracting this behavior? What is it that makes me kind of this poopy magnet where all this stuff comes and lands on me? Why do these things tend to keep happening to me? I might be attracting it in some way. Maybe I'm being too nice. 
uh, maybe I'm doing a little irritating or sarcastic behaviors and I don't know and then people are coming back at me, somehow I might be attracting this behavior. If I can figure out how I'm attracting it and then stop doing that, wow, a lot of these challenging situations, these difficult people are going to start going away. How am I causing this behavior? Maybe I interact with people in such a way that it causes them to want to come back at me. If I can figure out how I'm doing that and stop doing it, problem solved. Third thing, I'm not attracting it. I'm not causing it. It is totally the other person. Now, I've got to work with the piece that I can control. And the piece that I can control when the situation is just as I described, it's how am I allowing this behavior? Because if you allow the behavior, it continues. If you don't allow it, it typically stops. Those are the three ways that you can take personal responsibility for dealing with these challenges, and it's amazingly effective. This will deal with almost like 70 to 80% of the challenges before you even go through the rest of the techniques and the training. Now, here's some ways that you can use to make sure that people like you better so you never have these challenges in the first place. They always pick the most attractive targets to mess with. They want to mess with somebody that looks like an easy target and somebody that's not very good to them. Look down through this list. If I'm being friendly, positive, I'm giving sincere compliments, I'm praising this person, I'm seeking ways that I can help them, I give them good kind loving attention, I share things with them, I listen to them well and I express liking. For difficult people this is literally a list of all the things that they never got in their life and is probably the primary reasons, one through nine, of exactly why they're so damn difficult. If you are like this to them, and this is how you present to everybody, it's very unlikely that you'll become a target for difficult people. Why? Because they are starved for these things. Now, shameless plug, to get mental control, you should take my training on REBT. That's Rational Motor Behavioral Therapy. So it's literally the science of how to reprogram your brain, how to get rid of all the old negative self-talk and install positive self-talk, how to get rid of all the old negative habits, install positive habits. It's literally a manual for your brain. The one on Zen or Zen therapy, is basically Zen is the Chinese version of science. They're trying to find what's the ultimate truth in reality. It's a ton of different philosophies that aren't my truth, not your truth. They're the truth. They're ways of being in the world so that your world becomes so much better. It makes for a kinder, gentler you. You have a better understanding of how things work in the world and therefore you're more effective in the world. Now, NLP stands for neuro, which is brain, linguistic, which is language, and P, which is programming. So how your brain works, how it's affected by language, and how you program yourself. So this is a great way to gain skills. A lot of salespeople use this. It's another science of how your brain works and helps you to understand yourself and others so much more. I've also got one on coping skills. This will also help you deal with difficult people and persuasion strategies. This will help you get your way more often and you might even be able to persuade some of these difficult people. I think these are literally the five main life skills everybody needs regardless. Okay, that's it for this section and I'll see you in the next training. Here's another great set of techniques. This is how to be less of a target. So this is an absolutely dyed in the wool, stop them in their tracks technique, but it will work very, very well for making you a much smaller target and having these challenges far less often. Remember, no systems 100%. So the first system is make a friend. I love this quote by Abe Lincoln. It says, do I not destroy my enemies when I make friends of them? I remember there was this old lady we called her the troll. Well, I thought she was an old lady. I was probably 35 at the time, and she was probably 60. So she looked pretty old to me. Um, 
but she was just this nasty piece of work. She was always so negative about every single little thing that ever went on. She was manipulative. She was controlling. She was nasty. She went after people. She always had a harsh word for everybody. And I got stuck on the overnight shift with her. So instead of having a buffer of a dozen people walking around and milling around in the psych unit, it was just me and her alone in a room by ourselves. And I said, well, I've got to solve this because I can't do eight hour shifts three times a week with this woman between now and when I die. Not in this state of affairs. So what I did is I simply listened to her and tried to figure out how I could be friends with her. And I did that by intelligence gathering. I simply listened to things that were going on for her. I asked her questions. I said, you know, what do you do for fun? What do you like to do? What's your life like? What do you do outside the hospital? I wanted to find out some personal things about her. And she said, I don't really do anything. Yeah, but when you're not doing anything, uh, when you're actually doing something, what do you actually do? And she said, well, I go line dancing sometimes. I said, you like line dancing? She says, oh my God, I love it. You know, me and my husband, we go out and we have these groups and we have these line dancing lessons and we get together with all our buddies and we listen to good music and it's really good exercise and we, we make our own costumes and they're absolutely fantastic and we got these great clothes to wear and we have different competitions and we get prizes and then we all go out to eat after and we laugh and we have a few drinks and win or lose we just have a great great time so the way I made friends with her was to attach to that the next day I would ask her hey did you go out line dancing did you have fun with your buddies did you get a drink afterwards anybody tell you any good jokes at the bar uh, did you make any new outfits? Did you practice any new moves? Do you have a competition coming up? And as she's talking about these fun things that she likes to talk about, and she's looking at me, and she's enjoying herself and thinking about positive things, and she's looking at me, pretty soon she, opposed, uh, she connected me and positive things. That made our relationship very strong and very healthy, and she was never nasty to me. She was always good to me. She didn't change. She was still nasty to everybody else, but because we had become friends, she was good to me and nasty to everybody else. Matter of fact, she was extra good to me. You know why? Because I was probably her only friend. Great technique. So, I call this the Paul Poopy Theory. It's why do people poop on you? For one reason and for one reason only. Because they can. If they can't, guess what? they don't. My recommendation, don't let people step on you. Remember, you get the things in your life that you attract and that you allow. Don't allow people to ever be nasty to you. You stop them in their tracks, you use the techniques that you've learned here, you be assertive, and you let them know that that's not okay with you, that's not going to continue, and you shut them down. Now, this is a great section, and I love this section. It's how to deal with specific problem people. There's all kinds of different problem people out there, and I love to break it down and show you how to deal with each type, because each problem requires a slightly different solution. There's some overlap you'll see, but we want to be as targeted as possible so we can be as effective as possible. So, problem type number one, the people that love to whine, bitch, and complain. Do you know people that bitch, whine, and complain? Can you think about anybody that, like that in your life? There's an old quote, and I'll share it with you. It says, any fool can whine, bitch, and complain, and most fools do. Why are they whining, bitching, and complaining? Well, it's right here in black and white for you because they're a fool. So understand that they're a fool. Have a little bit of compassion. The person is actually too stupid not to whine, bitch, and complain. They actually confuse whine, bitching, and complaining with taking an action. These are the same people that bitch about the government and then don't vote. They don't march. They don't make contributions. They don't do anything. They complain about the company, but they never take any action. They don't have a sit-down meeting with the boss. They don't try to become management. They don't make any changes. They're really good at whining, bitching, and complaining. 
So let's move on to the solution. Now the first solution is ask them how they're going to solve the problem. You're going to get a look like you see it in the graphic here, this deer in the headlights look, because what you have to realize is their theory was whining, bitching, and complaining was actually doing something. If you ask them what they're actually going to do to take an action, they don't even understand what you're asking. It blows their little minds. They don't have an answer for that. They only, have, they only got as far as how to whine, bitch, and complain. They never thought about actually solving it. So when you ask them how to solve it, they're going to almost immediately stop talking about it because they no longer have what? Anything to say. Here's the other solution. I call this the proximity rule. Walk away and avoid them in the future. <laughs> they have to be near you to complain. I remember there was a comedian, there was an old joke, and he said, oh, I just realized you were annoying and my legs work. And he started walking away. That was his solution. That is actually the perfect solution. They have to be within shouting distance to complain. So I just walk away and I avoid them in the future. Very simple technique, very effective. When I hear somebody whine, bitching, and complaining, I hold a finger up and I say, wait a minute, I just realized I had a meeting. Hold that thought and I'll get back to you later. And I walk away. You can also just try ignoring them. I got a little joke here. It says, this has worked for women for thousands of years. <laughs> ignoring them means they'll stop talking to you. Typically when you ignore somebody, when they see they're not getting the attention, they don't repeat the behavior. Remember we said that you get the behavior that you allow and that you reward? Your attention is a very subtle reward to people. People love attention, but they hate to be ignored. So if you pay attention to them, they'll whine, bitch, and complain, and they'll do it more and more and more. If you ignore them, they'll do it less and less and less. Another problem type, bossy and aggressive people. Do you know anybody like this in your life? Here's some good solutions for them. Befriend them, just like we talked about before. Here's what I want you to remember. If you're taking notes, write this down. Friends don't attack friends. This will solve the problem. Next, like hangs out with like. So you can squeeze them out by hanging out with positive people who will support you. Negative people will not hang out around positive people. And the positive people that you're around will drown out the negative person. So no matter which one of those techniques works, staying around positive people will work. It will repel the negative and it will support the positive. Either way, you're going to what? You're going to defeat this person quickly and easily. So much easier than trying to do it on your own. Here's another solution that I love to use for a lot of different styles. Kick their butt. You know, just raise the cost of doing business. If they're being aggressive and they're being bossy, set a limit, be assertive, tell them it's not okay, back them off, let them know there's a cost to doing this and that you're not going to accept it. So within this technique, you're not allowing it. Remember, we get the things in our life that we allow. You're cutting that out. Then people tend to do things that are rewarded and tend to stop doing things that are consequenced or punished, so you're giving them a punishment here, it'll work for both reasons. Now, I call this type of person a sniper. They're the passive, not so passive, aggressive type people. They like making funny little jokes or little comments behind your back, you know, or snide little comments in staff meetings and things like this, or when you're around friends or coworkers. They're snipers. They just make these little comments, say, oh, I didn't mean anything by that. No, everything means something. So these people are typically difficult to deal with, but I'm going to show you some fast, simple, and easy ways to handle them right away. So solution. I take them aside. So even though they said something to me in public, I take them aside and I let them know that their comments are not okay and that they need to stop. Once you expose a sniper, they've lost all their power. The power of a sniper is you're getting shot at and you can't figure out where it's coming from. It's covert. If you make the covert overt, you uncover what is covered, 
you expose it, the technique no longer works for them. They can't snipe and not be exposed. Now, the first time I take them aside and I let them know that their comments are not okay and they need to stop, if they continue to do it, then I call them out in public. And I use technique number two. I ask them publicly. I say, hey, you didn't mean to hurt or disrespect me when you said that, did you? And they're very innocently going to say, oh, no, no, I didn't mean anything by that, Paul. Well, I think they're going to get it and everybody in the room is going to get it. I say this very innocently the first time I ask them publicly. The second time I ask it, I say, you didn't mean to hurt or disrespect me when you said that, did you? And when they say, oh, no, no, I didn't mean anything by that, I mention the history. You've done this several times, so I'm not really accepting your apologies anymore, and I'm calling you out on it. You need not to be hurtful to other people. You need not to disrespect other people. You state this publicly, and they'll no longer do it. They will pick on everybody else. Because remember, they're snipers. They only like to attack. They're cowards. They only like to attack under cover. Remove those covers. Call them out. That's their worst fear realized, and they will immediately stop. Here's another way to solve it. Have a conversation with their boss. And I put boss in quotes here because it can be anybody in their life that has influence over, him, over them. So who's the boss? And I use a little graphic here, the old TV show, literally called Who's the Boss? It's anybody that can influence them. A friend, a coworker, could actually be their boss boss, could be their boss's boss's boss, could be their girlfriend, could be their best buddy, could be just somebody that they admire or respect. Let that person know that you're having a challenge with them. Ask them if they can help you and literally help this person say, you know, Joe always likes to make these comments during staff meetings. It's really making him look bad. It's, it's impacting my job. It's becoming challenging. He's kind of looking like a jerk in front of everybody else. You know, at some point, I like to think that he'd like to move ahead in the company, and he can't do that when he's doing this sniping and making enemies because nobody's going to support him to management. So I'm wondering if you can take him aside, gentle reminder, word to the wise, and let him know that this just isn't going well for him. This is limiting his or her growth. Very effective technique. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for. Problem solving, specific techniques. Bring it on, baby. <laughs> I love that graphic. So let's get right to it. Now, the most important part of solving problems is to start with a great strategy. As you can see, the guy on the right didn't have a very good strategy. He brought a knife to a gunfight. Not a great start. He's not going to have a great finish either. Let's start by looking at relationships. Now, this isn't a relationship. It's a disaster. When one person has too much control, everything falls apart. Here's the major challenge with relationships. People are actually in a negotiation and they don't realize it. So what you have to realize is that people are constantly negotiating their relationships. So every time you do something, you're literally setting precedence. Me and my wife, we used to, back in the day, we used to go to Blockbuster and we would pick out a video and it was always an argument. Should we get this one? Should we get that one? Should we get the other one? Then what we did is we negotiated it and we said, okay, one week I'll pick, the, the next week you get to pick. And then if you pick a bad movie, I get the pleasure of picking on you for it. And if you pick a good movie, then everybody's happy. If I pick a bad movie, then at least you get the pleasure of picking on me for it. And if I pick a good movie, everybody gets the pleasure of it. That's a good solid negotiation. The other thing that we agreed to was, don't get too nervous about what anybody picks. Here's why. We're going to ultimately see every movie that's worth seeing. They're not making them quick enough. So you have to realize that you're in a negotiation. Otherwise, say you're dating someone and you go to the movies and you say to your girlfriend or you say to your boyfriend, uh, what movie would you like to see? And they pick the movie and you say, great. 
Well, if you do that a couple of times, what you're doing is you're setting what's called precedence. And now every time they're going to expect to be able to pick the movie. If they can't, they're going to be hurt, disappointed, they're going to act it back out, you know, they're going to retaliate in some way, shape, or form. They'll be passive aggressive or not so passive aggressive. And whatever's not worked out will be acted out. So you're constantly, constantly in a negotiation. The worst thing you can possibly do is be in negotiation and not realize it. Everything is a negotiation. So here's what you also have to realize. People do what works. So whether you reward something or punish something or accept something, your behavior is going to impact their future actions. So if you do something that I want you to do and I reward you, you're more likely to repeat it. Psychology 101 says that if you want a person to repeat a behavior, reward them. Think about it like dog training. If you give a dog a Scooby snack every time he does the right thing, he'll repeat it. If you punish him, you say bad dog, every time he does something wrong, the dog will stop doing it. So we want to reward the behaviors that we want to increase. We want to punish the behaviors that we want to decrease. And we've got to be careful of what behaviors we simply accept because now we're allowing these behaviors to go on. You can't have a behavior going on in your life that you don't accept. Stop everything you're doing, say I don't accept this, and go ahead and renegotiate. Especially in your relationships, especially with your significant others. Good negotiations actually solve a lot of problems too. Not sitting down, not renegotiating, and one partner or both partners being in pain never works. Limit setting and boundaries. I love this quote by Anne Catherine. It simply states, boundaries empower us to determine how we'll be treated by others. So I want to define two different things. A boundary is an area like this brick wall that you can't go beyond. I like to think of it like driving down the road. You've got a white line and a breakdown lane. That's like a limit setting. You can float within that breakdown lane as much as you want, but when you hit the guardrails, that's the point at, list at which I won't let you go beyond. You've hit a boundary. So there's soft boundaries, basically, which are limits. You can play in this area, but don't go past it. This is your warning area. You shouldn't even be in this area, but don't go past it. And if you come up against my ultimate boundary, a solid boundary, bam, you're really going to hit against it, and then everything stops and we have to go over and we have to have a discussion about this. You know, this is where I will no longer tolerate it. So there's limits and there's boundaries. Think of the limits as guidelines and the boundaries as true barriers. Literally a brick wall. If you set good limits and you set good boundaries, then people won't go past them. A lot of times we blame people because they come too far into our limits or they push past our boundaries. You have to take personal responsibility and say, how is it that they got past them? We let them. Now, remember we said relationships are one of the biggest problem areas. So the way that we get rid of most of the problems isn't by solving problems as they come up, but being proactive and make sure that we're following the basics of a healthy relationship so that we never have these issues. Now, if you allow people to be themselves, they won't push back. Therefore, you won't have any challenges. As long as you picked a good partner, this shouldn't be an issue. My wife and I have a great relationship. You know why? I let her do whatever she wants to do. She lets me do whatever I want to do. I don't do anything that's wrong. She doesn't do anything that's wrong. But there's certain things that she likes to do that I might not be involved with. And there's certain things that I do that she might not be involved in, especially when it comes to work things. So I don't care if you don't help me with something, but at least don't get in my way. So we always respect each other and allow that person to be themselves. Now you can look at that in an even deeper aspect and say, allow people to be themselves. People are going to want to do different things. My wife likes to talk on the phone a lot. I used to think that was a problem and that she was ignoring me. Then I realized I had more time to get work projects done. 
And if I did my work projects during that time, instead of wondering when she was going to get off the phone, I wasn't watching the pot boil, and therefore I didn't have as many issues with it. I just let it go. Then when I got done with my project, I came back. She was just about done with her phone call. It seemed like it was just a couple of minutes, and then she was spending time with me. The problem wasn't that she was on the phone. The problem was that I hadn't set up the right procedure, and I wasn't allowing her to be herself. If I get frustrated because she's on the phone X number of hours every day, I'm going to be frustrated between now and when I die because she's not going to change that. If I allow it and I figure out a way around it, then I'm happy for life. She does other things like that for me. That brings us to point number two, mutual respect. I don't cross her boundaries. She doesn't cross my boundaries. I love her. She loves me. I try to protect her and love her and worship her and she tries to do the same with me. That's mutual love and respect. Three is trust. I never worry about Bernadette when she leaves the house. I know she's not going to cheat on me. That's why I married her. Trust is always an issue within yourself. So if I have a fear that she's going to cheat when she goes out of the house, that's a fear that I have. It has nothing to do with Bernadette. I have trust issues. Bernadette doesn't worry when I leave the house. She knows I won't cheat on her. She has trust. Anytime that she gets a little nervous or a little jealous, I remind her that has to do with you. We've been together about 25 years. No cheating yet. So quarter century pretty much tells you you can trust that person. Trust is a key issue. Think of the opposite of these things as well. You don't allow somebody to be themselves. You don't give them mutual respect. You don't trust them. What's going to happen then? Your relationship will be destroyed. The fourth one, and I think this is the easiest one to build upon and to do on a daily basis, is kindness and concern. Why are you in a relationship with this person if you don't love them, care about them, want to do nice things for them, you don't worry about them? I show my wife love and kindness and giving and concern. I do nice little things for her all day long. We get into a competition. I try to be nicer to Bernadette than she is to me, and Bernadette tries to be nicer to me than I am to her. So it's a positive upward spiral. You want to create those positive spirals in your life of love and kindness and caring and concern. That's a positive relationship. Now notice what happens when you do the opposite of that. I don't care as much about you, you don't care as much about me, therefore you care even less, therefore I care even, even less, and this downward spiral ensues. Pretty soon we're arguing, we're fighting, and we're each blaming the other person. You've got to take charge. You can always start a positive spiral by doing positive things. Sometimes they're a little slow to catch on. You've got to do it two or three times until it becomes a habit. <laughs> you know, sometimes you've got to crank the pump more than a couple of times before the water comes out. So you have to prime the pump. Five, helping each other, but not enabling each other. I will help Bernadette with virtually anything, but I won't do things for her. What I mean by that is, like, Bernadette will do CEUs for her nurse's license. So I will help her with a couple of questions, or I'll teach her where to find the answers, but I'm not going to take the exam for her. Does that make sense? Helping, but not enabling. Six, being responsible for your actions. Think of it this way. You get into an argument with your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your significant other, friend. Could be anybody you're in a relationship with. Could be a parent, could be a brother, sister, child. No matter what happened, it's almost never 100% that person's fault. Say that person was a complete jerk, but you said something about it afterwards. So 90% their fault, 10% your fault. Here's what I want you to do. Be responsible for your 10%. Say, hey, I felt bad that we got in an argument the other day. You know, you said blah, 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 and I came back at you. I probably shouldn't have said that. So I, feel, I felt bad about that, and I just want to let you know that. That's not letting them off the hook for what they did or what they said, but it's owning up your piece. And as you take responsibility for your piece and you see it accurately, you'll only take responsibility for that piece. That separates you out emotionally so that you're not taking responsibility for the whole thing, or even half when it's only 10%, and it shows the other person that even though you were minutely at fault and they were majorly at fault, 
you took responsibility. It shows them that you were the bigger man or the bigger woman. They will nine times out of ten, either on the spot or within a day or two or within a few hours, come back and they will own their part. Why? Because you did a good job of role modeling this for them. So this is a wonderful system for how to have good, healthy relationships, 